Welcome back. It's time for another lesson. This time we're going to be talking about the electric field produced by distributed charges. So, what is a distributed charge anyway? The idea is someone's taken a can of charge paint, for example, and painted some surface, or distributed the charge along some shape. So a line, for example, a ring, a disk, or later we'll see a, uh, you can even distribute charge throughout a volume, like a sphere or a block. Let's start with the easiest. Let's talk about a ring. So I've got a ring of charge with some radius, and I'm some distance z away, and for the moment let's just talk about the electric field along the axis. The, uh, the idea is that I break the charge of the ring up into chunks, and each chunk produces a little field, delta E, and all I have to do is to compute the direction and magnitude of each of these little delta E fields produced by the individual chunks, and then add them up to get the total field produced by the ring overall. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that uh, delta E is a vector, you can see that it does not point along the axis, but there's an interesting symmetry of the ring. If I take the charge directly opposite the charge that's indicated and calculate its field, everything's the same except the x and the y components of the field will turn out to be exactly the opposite. And so when you add those two chunks fields together, the x and y components will cancel and the z component will survive. Well, since every chunk on the ring has an opposing chunk on the opposite side, that means that when you add all the chunks together, the x and y components will cancel out, and the z component will not. So in the end, all we care about is the z component, because that's the only component that lives. Notice that there's an angle between the electric field chunk, delta E, and the z-axis, and let's call that angle phi. It's the same angle on the other side, and you can see that the cosine of phi is nothing other than z divided by r, the distance between the chunk and the point on the axis where we're calculating the field. So if I, all I care about is the z component of the field, I can compute the dez, or the delta ez, the z component of the chunk, as the a coulomb, 1 over r squared, electric field magnitude times the cosine of phi. But uh, the cosine of phi, of course, is z divided by r, so when I put that all in, I get dq over 4 pi epsilon 0, and then z over r cubed. Two factors of r come from the 1 over r squared dependence of the electric field on magnitude, and one, the other factor of r comes from the cosine of phi. There you go. So now all I have to do is to add up all these dezs and... Uh, since nothing actually depends on theta, then notice as I move around the ring, the only variable I'm changing is theta, and none of the things in the expression for dez depend on theta. It's just the dq. So if I integrate around the ring, uh, all I'm doing is adding up all the charges, and so the whole thing is just equal to the total charge divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 times z over r cubed. And that's the answer. Let's uh, take a minute to think about what that answer is telling us. It says that at any point, there's an electric field pointing away from the ring. And the magnitude is a little interesting. If I graph the magnitude as a function of z, notice that it goes to 0 at the origin. And that's simply because the electric field from each chunk on the ring, uh, when you add those guys up, they add up to 0. Because there's a field from one side, it points uh, away from the other side, and then the opposite side, it points away from the opposite side, and those two guys cancel. So you get no field at the origin. As you move away from the origin, the field becomes uh, larger. It's, it grows linearly at first, and that's simply because the z squared in the denominator is so small compared to the r squared, it can be neglected. And you see you get an electric field that's proportional to z. But as z becomes larger, it tar starts to become comparable to r squared. Ultimately, z squared becomes much greater than r squared. And when you reach that stage, you'll get, uh, you can neglect the r squared downstairs, and you end up with z over z cubed, or 1 over z squared. 
In fact, if you look at it, you can see the expression just goes to the point charge expression, q over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared, as you get very far from the ring, much f farther than the radius of the ring. If you look at the electric field vector near the ring, you'll see that the vector uh, goes to zero at the origin, it gets larger as you move away, and then it starts to get smaller again. So there is some distance from the ring where the electric field has a maximum magnitude. Okay, let's take a minute to do a little demo so you can see how this uh, adding of the electric field from each chunk works. Here's a little demo from the authors of the textbook. This is a ring of charge. And the idea is, every time I click on the picture, we're going to see the contribution from one chunk. So here's the contribution from one chunk. There's the R vector. There's the electric field from that chunk. Then I click again, and we're going to see the superposition of the electric field from these two chunks. There's the electric field from the first chunk. There's the electric field from the second, the third, the fourth. And what I'm seeing here in the orange, or whatever this is, is... Um, Let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. You can see that it's adding up the electric field due to each of those guys, and that's producing this orange guy. So if I keep going around, you can see that um, the field from each chunk on the ring, that set of fields forms kind of a cone. And when you add up all those guys, the sum is this big guy. Let's see if I can zoom out here a little bit so you can see it. Wow, it goes way out there. So that big guy is the electric field produced. It's the sum of all those fields. Notice it points along the axis. It doesn't have any component in the x and y directions um, transverse to the axis. So there you have it. Okay, so let's move on and talk about the thin rod. So the idea of the rod is that there's an electric field that points away from the rod. I, I take some charge and I paint it over the rod, and uh, I want to know what's the electric field in the neighborhood of the rod. And looking down from above, the electric field looks a little bit like the electric field of a point charge, but we're going to find out that it's not exactly the same as the electric field of a point charge. Let's look at the geometry a little bit. If I imagine taking a chunk of charge from the rod and calculating the electric field, you'll notice that uh, it's a little bit like the ring, but with one major difference, and that is as I go from chunk to chunk in the rod, the distance between the chunk and the field point is going to change. With the ring, all the distances were the same because of the symmetry. In this case, the distance r is not going to be a constant, but it's actually going to change as you move up and down the rod. In order to actually carry out the sum, we can work it out on the computer, kind of like I did in the demo for the ring, but uh, we can also use calculus. So let's, let's try that second approach and use calculus. I want to point out that if you, uh, if you look at the chunks of charge on either side of the point where you're computing the field, if you go the same distance on either side, you get equal magnitude electric fields, and just as it did with the ring, the transverse components are going to cancel, and only the component that points away from the rod is going to survive. The, uh, the other point is that this is useful uh, only if you're at the midpoint of the rod, because if you're not at the midpoint, then you're going to reach a stage where you get to a distance where you run out of rod on one side, but you don't run out of rod on the other. So what that tells you is that the electric field only points exactly away from the rod at the midpoint. It turns out, if you don't go very far from the midpoint, it still effectively points away from the rod to a very good approximation, because the places on the rod where the uh, two charge chunks uh, don't cancel are very far from the field point, and the 1 over r squared ensures that their effect is minimal. So in practice, it turns out, as long as you're not very far from the midpoint of a rod, the electric field is essentially uh, directed away from the rod. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and calculate the electric field at the midpoint of the rod, and then at least we'll get some understanding of what we're, what we're uh, shooting for.
So again, the idea is we're going to add up the electric field, do the, each of these chunks of charge. Now the chunks are going to become infinitesimal. I'm going to use the integral approach. And so dq over r squared is the electric field due to a single chunk of size dq. Now the question is, how big, of, how big are these chunks? And the answer is, you take dy over l, that's the fraction of the rod in length. dy is the size of a chunk, l is the length of the whole rod, so dy divided by l is the fraction of the rod that we're talking about. If I multiply that by the charge on the whole rod, I get the fraction of the charge. So that's dq, the amount of charge in one chunk. I divide that guy by r squared. I'm now, and I'm going to treat the uh, distance away from the rod. I'm going to call that z, just like we did for the ring. And the distance from the midpoint, I'm going to call that y. And so you can see that uh, I just have dq over r squared, that's z squared plus y squared, by the Pythagorean theorem. And I still have an r hat in there, which tells me the direction of the field. Now, r hat is going to be cosine theta for the x component and minus sine theta for the y component. And cosine theta, you can see from the diagram, is just z over r. Sine theta is y over r, and I'm going to have a minus sine theta because, as you can see in the picture, r hat has a negative y component. So, um, and I, I should say, it's a little goofy. Uh, I've got z over r as the x component. I should call that really the horizontal component. I'm letting, in this picture, z goes to the right, y goes up and down. So the horizontal component is the first component. It's z over r. Now, when you go and do the integral, you can see that the y component is actually going to result in zero uh, net integral because on the one side of y equals zero, the thing is going to be positive. On the other side of y equals zero, it's going to be negative with the same sign. And so when you do the integral from minus L over 2 to plus L over 2, the full length of the rod, the second component, the vertical component in that R hat, is going to end up with no net integral. Only the horizontal component is going to survive. And so we'll end up with just the Z component of E. So I'll just drop the y component or the vertical component, and, uh, and we'll just do the z component. Uh, the integral is not hard. I'm not going to do it here because it's, it, it's going to take many lines of algebra and so on. And so I'm just going to give the result. You can talk to your instructor or you can read the book to get the detailed step by step. But that's the answer right there. And uh, you'll notice that it's got a... Uh, square root of z squared plus L over 2 squared. That's the distance between the end of the rod and the field point. And then it's also got a z, which is the distance from the midpoint of the rod to the field point. So it's an interesting, it's sort of like a, a geometrical product of those two sides. If you were to draw a triangle from the end of the rod to the field point, the first, the factor with the square root would be the length of that hypotenuse and the z would be the length of the short side that goes directly to the rod. Let's talk about the limits of this expression. Um, if z is much less than l, we can neglect the z in the denominator. In the z squared plus l over 2 squared, we can neglect that z. We can't neglect the other z because it's a product, it's a factor in the whole thing. So we end up with a situation like this. We get 1 over 4 pi e epsilon 0 we get twice the charge density, Q over L, divided by just the distance. So notice this is a 1 over Z electric field, not a 1 over Z squared electric field. So near the rod, the electric field drops inversely in proportion to the distance away from the rod. However, if Z becomes very large, we can neglect the Z over the uh, L over 2 in that denominator. Then we get the square root of z squared, which is a z. And in that limit, we do go back to the point charge formula, q over z squared, times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So in the, as you get very far from the rod, much, much farther than the size of the rod itself, this thing reduces to a point charge formula, just as you'd expect, just as it does for the ring. If you get very far away from the ring, it goes to a point charge formula. But if you're close to the rod, you can see that it changes character to a 1 over z electric field. Okay.
Let's, let's go ahead and look at the disk. The disk is a, uh, I'm thinking of a circular disk, something like this. And the trick to this one is to notice that you can think of a disk as just a sum of rings, a superposition of individual rings. So we can go back to our ring solution and treat each chunk of charge on the disk as an individual ring and uh, simply basically write down the answer. So the idea is the electric field from one chunk of ring is the charge on the ring uh, and the, using the ring formula from a few slides ago. The question is what is dq? Well dq is the fraction of the charge in the chunk and so that's simply the circumference of the chunk times the width of the chunk, dr, that's the area occupied by the chunk, divided by the area of the whole disk, which is pi r squared. So that ratio, 2 pi r dr over pi r squared, is the fraction of the charge in the chunk. I multiply that by the total charge on the disk, and I get the fraction, I get the total charge in the chunk. That's the idea. Now I plug that guy back into the formula for the electric field, and I grind away for a little bit, and I integrate. And it turns out the answer comes out like this. It looks pretty hideous. It looks uh, complicated. But it's useful to look at some limits. So for example, let's say if z is much less than r, then I could ignore the z squared in the denominator on the right, and I get this simplified version, right? 1 minus z over r, big R. If z is really much, much less than big R, so that I can even neglect the z over r compared to 1, I get a super simple answer, and that is that the electric field is basically constant. It doesn't depend on z at all for very, very small values of z compared to r. And then the other end is if I let z become much greater than r. Now I'm going to let you guys do this on the board, but uh, it's not too bad. It turns out you get the electric field goes like the point charge formula if you're very, very far away. You need to remember that power law approximation when uh, 1 plus x to the n, when x is much less than 1, that guy. But uh, it comes right out. Okay, so let's finally finish up with this sphere. So the idea of a spherical shell. A spherical shell is like a, uh, it's a little bit like a basketball. It's got material inside its empty, outside it's empty, but there's a there's material in a thin range of values of R that correspond to the radius of the shell. Now the idea is outside the shell, the answer is, it turns out the electric field is just what you'd get if all that charge was compressed to a point at the center. Inside the shell, it turns out the electric field is zero. We've actually seen this before, but uh, that that's the easy to remember answer. And so it, once you have that idea, you can actually do all kinds of spherically symmetric problems directly. The example I want to talk about is a uniformly charged sphere of charge. So now what I mean is there's charge throughout the volume of the sphere, and I want to know what's the electric field inside and outside the sphere. Well, outside the sphere, it's trivial because you can think of each of the shells that make up the uniform volume distribution as producing an electric field that's just a point charge with all the charge at the center. So the net result is when you're outside a uniformly charged sphere of charge, the thing acts like a point charge where all the charge is at the center. That's straightforward. Um, what happens when uh, you're inside the sphere? Well, when you're inside the sphere, it's, it's actually quite easy. You divide the sphere into two parts. The part that's got a radius that's less than your radius and the part that has a radius that's greater. The stuff that has a radius less than your radius, it acts like a point charge. The stuff whose radius is greater than your radius, you, you don't even have to count because it corresponds to a set of shells who are all outside your radius and so they produce no electric field. So um, it's quite easy. It's quite easy. Let's, let's calculate the charge inside the spherical shell at your radius. So basically what you do is take the density of the charge times the volume of that interior sphere. Well, the density is the total charge divided by 4 thirds pi big R cubed. The volume of the interior sphere 
is 4 thirds pi little r cubed, the 4 thirds pi is cancel, and you simply get that it's the total charge times the ratio little r to big R cubed. The little r cubed comes from the radius of the little sphere, the big R cubed comes the radius of the big sphere. Now I want to calculate the electric field, so I take the charge enclosed, I treat it as a point charge at the center, and I so I divide by r squared. But if I put in the expression for the charge enclosed, notice it has a little r cubed in it. So the little r cubed from the charge enclosed cancels with the little r squared from the 1 over r squared law, and you end up with uh, an electric field that's actually proportional to r. The electric field increases linearly as you go from the center to the uh, surface of the sphere of uniformly distributed charge. It's pretty neat. So that's all there is for today. We'll see you guys next time.